Okay, this is part four of Power in Place, Indian Education in America, or at the top of page 70. <clears throat> education today must now undertake, oops. Education today must now undertake a serious examination of these questions. And there is no better place to begin than classrooms in American Indian communities. Here, uh, there still exists an experiential metaphysics and worldview that approaches technology as an essentially as essentially a question of nature and how we human beings live with and in nature. <clears throat> For the sake of clarification, I submit that two very different very different understandings of technology we are are oh my God. I submit that two very different understandings of technology are the issue. A deep-seated, metaphysically based, Western view of technology as science applied to industrial manufacture and commercial ob objectives versus a metaphysically based American Indian, or rather indigenous view of technology as practices and tool making to enhance our living in and with nature. The Western conception and practices of technology are bound up in essentially human-centered materialism, the doctrine that physical well-being and worldly possessions constitute the greatest good and highest value in life. <clears throat> Indigenous conceptions and practices of technology are embedded in a way of living life that is inclusive of spiritual, physical, emotional, and intellectual dimensions emergent in the world, or more accurately, particular places in the world. We cannot afford to minimize or soft, soft sell the situation in which we find ourselves. The problems we most likely, and certainly our children and grandchildren, will face are monumental. Environmental degradation, technological imperialism, consumerism for consumerism's sake, what Thorstein Velbin called conspicuous consumption, and increasing social dysfunction. Yet, there is reason to be cautiously optimistic. We, because we have literally reached a place, or should I say, or I should say places, in the modern world where the plethora of problems that surround us are rising to a level where they cannot be ignored. Nevertheless, there is hope for our children because there is hope for our children because, in spite of what some of humankind has sought to improve and control in the natural world, tremendous beauty and wisdom are still around us. the The challenge of indigenous education is to expand the ability of children to experience the world, the world they are part are a part of as their home, an environment or refuge of happiness with hard work and love with respect, we can and must educate general generation of children who find hope in the landscapes and ecologies they inhabit. As you make great strides in ecological knowledge at beginning of the 21st century, the problem human beings face today is simply summed up by the following question. What exactly is the ecological niche of human beings? Although scientists have painstakingly sought to classify and analyze all the other life forms on our planet, it strikes me as odd that they have spent so little time considering just what our human beings niche might be. Many of us human beings have sought to distinguish ourselves from the rest of nature, but to what end? What purpose? Human beings in Western and modern Western civilization have historically identified culture as the primary feature distinguishing us from other animals, specifically tool making or technology. And language have until very recently been thought to clearly demarcate us, humans from them, other animals. Some of us have found great solace in thinking of ourselves with our culture as above other humans as above other animals and the natural world in general. It is this human cultural context that must be placed in a broader understanding of natural history. If we are to understand ourselves and within our culture, technology must be very scrutinized. 
indigenous American Indian traditions, we believe, are our best guides for reassessing technology, for they represent practical ways of seeing technology as a part of nature. It is difficult for many adults in modern American industrial or post-industrial society to understand that the natural world, and to be precise, local ecosystems, ought to play a major role in determining the technologies we employ. The examples are so obvious in hindsight. I repeat, in hindsight. What we do well to pause before we leap headlong into bioengineering utopia, we are presently being promised. Living close to the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri rivers for the last three decades, it has been interesting to watch people's reaction in the 1990s to having, within the span of several years, two 500-year floods, dams and levees, while good at, while good for urban development and large agribusinesses, are overall ill-conceived given, given the degradation of riparian e ecosystems and water quality, not to mention the flood damage and costs to the federal, to the federal government. Dakota anthropologist Bia Medicine has discussed the, de the destruction to sustainable Dakota agricultural practices that ensued with the damming of the Missouri River on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Wisely, the Dakota farmed in the rich river bottoms, but set up their villages above them. They knew better than to set, set up villages on the river's edge, although in fair weather there was no obstacle to, cam there was no obstacle to camping there. No synthetic fertilizers were needed, for when the floods came as they surely would, the soil would be enriched and replenished. Likewise, there were no damages to human-made dams, levees, or end domiciles. <clears throat> My friend and colleague Cynthia Annette, a riparian ecologist, likes to say, rivers have memories. No matter where we, humans, want them to go, they remember ancient paths. The Dakota knew this and chose to live in a manner that respected their Missouri River's memory. The counterpoint to this understanding is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who have never met a river they could not dam, compared to genetic engineering, building dams and levees to control rivers ought to be relatively easy, but rivers are hard to control. All the variables that combine to produce the incredible flooding, we are now told, could not have been predicted. In short, Nature and the rivers had their way. The notion that technology can translate into control of nature is, as stated earlier, nothing more than, to borrow a phrase, if turnabout is fair play, a mythology, although a very modern one. <clears throat> this paragraph is called Technology in the Big Picture. Bridging Gaps in Technology and Culture. This was the theme at the 1998 Hazardous Waste Research Conference, where I suggested to scientists and engineers they address this problem by first acknowledging a complex set of interrelations in a formula I called TC3. Technology, community, communication, and culture are intimately related. <clears throat> Try to imagine any one of the four existing among human beings without the other three. You cannot. I summarize this relationship for scientists and engineers as the TC3 formula. Haskell Environmental Research Studies Center programs and projects over the last five years have reminded me of, an important, of the importance of the TC3 formula because unfortunately, most Americans live, live as if this relationship is unknown. That we speak in, of gaps in or between technology and culture is, is crucial, for it is symptomatic of a serious obstacle to understanding. <clears throat> These gaps obscure the reality that technology is a part of culture as are the forms of community and communication assume. This, the recognition that gaps, eg that gaps exist, suggests the issue is far more academic. Rather, 
the issue strikes at the core of how we are to think about technology and what education and environmental research ought to be about today. The way we live and our respect for the, re for the places where we live, our homes and communities, the advantage of Deloria's power in place equal personality equation is that when applied to technology, it forces one to frame technology in the big picture. Many scholars, scientists, and engineers are engaged in problem solving and research as if TC3 were unimportant. Disciplinary boundaries and professional specialization force many to work in conceptual boxes, and we increasingly live literally in isolated slash insulated physical boxes. The result is a natural and social forgetfulness about the way in which technology, community, communication, and culture are related. Collectively, our human ancestors may very well have possessed a wisdom modern human society, societies desperately needed. A wisdom not produced by superior intelligence or rationality, but born of direct experience and subsequent, subsequent reflection. The wisdom resides in the recognition that modern dichotomy between human slash social issues versus technology slash technical issues is a false one, an invidious, invi invidious distinction. Technology and human are as inseparable as human beings are from their natural environments. Reading human history, one is impressed by the extent to which it is full of humankind's self-declared self superiority, however, most recent entries appear to evolve around technological achievements. For good reason, human evolution has resulted in an, in an attribute that anything but physical or adaptive as, as it is ordinarily conveyed in the beginning biology courses. <clears throat> Our uniqueness as a species is found in the ability to use technology to live in environments that would otherwise be largely uninhabitable by humans and the societies on which we depend. Our capacity to manipulate environmental elements to compensate for our physiological awkwardness is what nature has given us two-legged two persons to work with to secure our lives. It appears natural selection has not selected us for a particular niche or a place on the planet, but has selected traits that have allowed human beings, with the use of technology, to adapt to different places and environments on our Mother Earth. Central among those traits is our sociability or social nature. Unlike the social dimension found in many animals, for example, big cats, wolves, bears, dolphins, and of course higher primates, our physiological awkwardness dictates a necessity for tool making and manipulation absent among other animal species. <clears throat> this is less a sign of human superiority than a sign of biological difference. In my mind, this explains why in our traditional indigenous ways of speaking and praying, we so often describe ourselves as pitiful beings. Humans depend on many good relations and, and relatives to live and survive in this world. Hardly superstition, just ecological fact. Nature, nurture, and technology are intimately connected. <clears throat> Our American Indian societies understood this profoundly important point. Our evolutionary past has not made human beings superior, but merely different. We identify our culture or social sphere as what distinguishes us from other biological life. But with respect to other humans, this is less a case of absolute uniqueness than an issue of degree. <clears throat> Elizabeth Marshall Thomas has demonstrated this in her wonderful book, Tribe of the Tiger. Yet it is the degree to which our social behavior revolves around the development of technology that distinguishes us from other animals and explains why we should consider technology as central to human nature and history. We ought to give up on our modern notions of human superiority, lest our, technologi lest our technolog technological successes as typically measured, become our defeat and the destruction of our home, the Earth's biosphere. 
and many of the relatives we share with it. <clears throat> From primitive tool making to the advent of modern machinery, our primary goal was to fashion material culture, clothing, shelter, utensils, and so on, that provided a social and cultural adaptation to environments and places. Throughout most of human history, places and environments shaped and limited the kinds of human the kinds of cultures humans created. Places, technologies, and cultures were inextricably connected, inextricably, inextricably connected. The Loria's power in place equal personality equation, or P3, formula, makes for a spatial metaphysics of experience. The TC3 expression technology community, communication, and culture is an attempt to identify the natural culture feature of human beings. P3 and TC3 are not rigorous mathematical equations. Rather, I think of both as symbolic expressions that can serve as mnemonic devices <clears throat> that preclude thinking of technology, or for that matter, any of the key features of human culture as outside of nature. <clears throat> Our biological and geographical diverse natural environments shaped how we live, how we lived. Our livelihood activities, shelters, clothing, and much of our symbolic non-material culture, Keith Basso's book, Wisdom Sits in Places, brilliantly documents the extent to which Western Apache history is less about time than places, or what might be called a sense of place. New technologies has given humans the ability to reshape environments and geographies to accommodate comfort and convenience. And we are increasingly preoccupied with the physical rearrangement, manipulation, or engineering of natural environments. <clears throat> John Locke set out the rationale for this mode of living 300 years ago. In Locke's philosophy, the rest of nature existed ultimately for humankind's benefit and convenience. It was a short step to reason that if natural environments do not meet our human standards for comfort, convenience, and aesthetic beauty, we ought to change them to do so. Modern technology allows us to do this to do precisely this, but at what cost? I believe the cost is a growing absence of a sense of place for human communities and correspondingly modern culture which are literally groundless 30 years ago Vindaloria jr described modern societies as rushing to create an artificial universe Vindaloria may be one of the few non-technical scholars unsurprised by discussions about artificial intelligence globalization and virtual realities communities, persons, and so forth. Human beings failed to experience the world as our ancestors did, and as many of my, of my living indigenous elders do, because our technologies increasingly insulate us from direct experience and the acquisition of experiential knowledge from natural environments. Automobiles, te television, air conditioning, and computers, to pick four obvious examples, result in human convenience, entertainment, comfort, and escape from, incredibly, from incredible drudgery. But I, in, but I interact less directly and physically in time and space with other human beings in the natural environment because of the ease, comfort, privacy or relation isolation or relative isolation with which I can use these technologies. <clears throat> Technology in general, in general, has shaped most of people's everyday lives, often in measurable positive ways. But here is the irony. As we disengage technology from communities, which includes plants, animals, and geographic slash geologic features, with a sense of with a sense of place and thereby create cultures and forms of communication that are relatively abstract, we unconsciously destroy conditions for our human survival and threaten the lives of many other plants and animals with whom we share this biosphere. I am not anti-technology. My human nature dictates otherwise. But my nature also requires community, nurture. 
And currently we pose the quest for community and new technologies as if they were mutually exclusive endeavors. They are not. This knowledge ought to give us reason to pause, not because of fear for what technologies literally do, but out of concern for their residual effects, the unintended byproducts of our human use of technology. Fortunately, there is some promise in the fact that we are beginning to have powerful allies in the dominant and mainstream system of education. Leading educators, child psychologists, and psychiatrists recently endorsed a report by the Alliance for Childrenhood, Fools, uh, for Childrenhood Fool's Gold, a critical look at computers in childhood, <clears throat> and signed a petition suggesting an immediate moratorium on the further introduction of computers in early childhood and elementary education. It might be hoped that adults take notice of what extended computer time does to them. A study by scientists at Carnegie Mellon University found that as individuals increase time on computers, they also increased feelings of loneliness and depression. What does it tell us when the high, t when the high tech interconnectivity of webs and nets leaves us feeling disconnected? It tells us that technology is potentially impoverishing and harmful to the soul, to our spiritual and interior lives that are formed by the numbers of good relations we acknowledge and maintain. If we human beings begin our understanding of the natural world with the big picture, we must acknowledge our relatively, relatively recent arrival to our Mother Earth's biosphere. <clears throat> The result ought to be a kind of biological modesty. For many of our biosphere communities, community members have been here much longer than we have. In the minds of many scientists, such as Richard Leakey, some of our biosphere neighbors may outlive us. <clears throat> our traditional indigenous cultures are literally grounded in the geographies and natural environments to which we are historically connected. In fact, history itself and our worldviews, philosophy, and material culture were, and in varying degrees, still are shaped by a sense of place. If human beings continue to live as if ecology and evolution had, were, have given us a privileged place in the natural order of things, our human history may very well be a footnote in the life story of our Mother Earth. It would be an ancient coyote, coyote story, writ large if the, if the technology human beings used to ensure our physical and material comfort and convenience resulted in no place to live on this planet, an ultimate form of homelessness that resulted in our extinction. We can bridge the technology and culture gap if we are willing, if we are willing not only to acknowledge the TC3 relationship, but also to change the way we live. Human survival and the survival of many of our relatives may depend on it. Okay, this is chapter nine, transitional education. <clears throat> education has a transitional function of moving individuals from one status or connection to another. <clears throat> In the old ways, we used to mark these transi transitions by giving the individual a new name, a name that would more accu accurately summarize his or her achievements. Today, we award certificates, diplomas, and degrees to mark each step the student takes. But education itself is transitional. New theories and concepts are continually intruding the established patterns of teaching and institutional organization so that the experience of education changes radically from generation to generation. For American Indians, there is an additional element to be considered because Indian school systems are at best transitory. There is no predictability in the actions of Congress that would assure, that would reassure the people that a decent education will always be available to them. Indian education is conceived to be a, to be a temporary expedient for the purpose of bringing Indians out of their primitive state 
to the higher levels of civil civilization. Presumably, when this ill-defined status is reached, there will be no more use for, spe for special programs in Indian education. The goal of much of the modern education seems to be socialization. That is to say, with some few exceptions, we are training people to present an acceptable profile to the corporate industrial world. Our undergraduate degrees actually certify that the student has a smattering of knowledge about a number of fields, is fairly well acquainted with one particular field, and can accommodate himself or herself to institutional life. We pretend otherwise, but this goal is what we actually have in mind. Indian education is somewhat unique in that in that it has always been uh, premised upon the idea of assimilation without regard to socialization. <clears throat> From the very beginning, first missionaries, first missionaries, <clears throat> from the very beginning, first missionaries and later government teachers sought to erase the cultural backgrounds of Indian children with the naive belief that once a vacuum was created, Western social mores and beliefs would naturally rush in to replace long-standing tribal practices and customs. A review of Indian education programs of the past three decades will demonstrate that they have been based upon very bad expectations. In 1960, there, approximately, there were approximately 2,000 Indians in higher education. Financed primarily by private scholarship funds and individual and family efforts. <clears throat> and 2000 best estimates show that we have something like 70,000 Indians in various forms of higher education, financed by a bewildering variety of sources, including colleges and universities, private groups, state scholarship, and several forms of federal assistance. In spite of our continual complaints, it should be obvious that Indian education has made some major progress since 1960, and that while funds are hard to come by for many students, the overall picture appears very bright. Yet, we are all discontented with, that, with what is happening in Indian education, and we cannot quite put our finger on why. The majority of funds in title... <coughs> <clears throat> um, Title IX and other programs have concentrated on the sciences and administration and management. And yet, as we look around at both the reservation programs and the distribution of, distribution of Indians in private industry, we find little, little evidence that the efforts of the last 40 years have made a difference. We still need many Indian educational administrators. We have a pressing need for management personnel, and we still great we still have great difficulty finding Indians working in the indus in the industry. Reservation and border town schools appear to be falling even farther behind the national norms, and many schools are simply thinly disguised holding pens to keep the young people institutionalized during the day until they reach a certain age when we can demand that they behave like adults. The outbreak of devil worship on some reservations and the growing drug problems on others demonstrate the inadequacy of the present situation. <clears throat> this chapter is called, I mean, uh, this paragraph is called, So what problem are we actually facing and how do we deal with it? Education has generally been misunderstood by its practitioners. It is defined as both process and content, and it is exceedingly difficult to tell from educational behavior and philosophy whether or not the educator is making the proper distinctions. We can divide Indian education into two basic periods, the period of content and the period of process. From the beginning of the Republic, in fact, from the beginning of contact, education was primarily a matter of providing content in ways of thinking and of things and new facts. From the Merriam Report of 1928 until the present, we have been living in the age of process, 
which is to say, we have been more concerned with how children learn than with what they learn. During the past 40 years, we have been exclusively concerned with how they learn and have almost studiously avoided asking what it is they are learning. This situation is particularly difficult for students who are studying science because, in most respects, science is content and not process. It's content and not process. <clears throat> Consequently, after educating Indian young people in schools and stress learning experiences, we suddenly place upon them the demand that they accommodate themselves to the scientific exper enterprise which is to say, build scientific expertise on a secondary education that has very little content. The student has no choice except to attempt to learn the scientific curriculum as well as gain background in the mass of conflicting ideas that now passes for Western civilization. When the social adjustment from Indian community-based culture to non-Indian urban networking culture has, be, has to be made at the same time, many students adopt a very rigid posture concerning personal, group, and community values. <clears throat> Too often, they model themselves after the professionals in their academic field or their institutional situation. This adjustment then forces them outside their Indian circle and greatly inhibits their ability to draw from their own tribal uh, traditions the lessons that could be profitably learned regarding both science and the social world in which they live. <clears throat> that we are producing any Indians in science at all is a tribute to the perseverance of this generation of Indian young people. Where then do we start to make changes in Indian education so that we can deal with the problems we perceive? Perhaps the first step we can take is to admit that education is transitional and that it has both a beginning and an end. Indian education will certainly begin with certain within the Indian community, be it a reservation, small town, or urban setting. Recent legisla legislation, most notably the Indian Education Act, has attempted to deal with this, beginning by requiring that schools receiving federal funds that have Indians on their school boards and advisory committees. <clears throat> Here, Indians were placed within the process of education but not allowed to determine its content. In Indian survival schools, Indians were allowed to determine the content but were generally isolated from the process of education. Consequently, few schools at the primary and secondary levels have been able to do very much about improving education as a whole. <clears throat> when we look closely at the idea of transitional process, we must note that the goal or result should have been contained within the beginning and should flow directly out of it as the potential to be realized. <clears throat> the old Indians saw this necessity at once. The famous saying of Sitting Bull, basically that the people should take what is good of the white person and reject what is bad, assumed that the start of the Indians would begin in and always have recourse to their own communities and cultural traditions. The missing element here, or rather, the conclusion that we always avoid drawing, is the context in which education occurs. Context is also the beginning. It is not only the place to start, it is the channel within which all other developments must occur. Modern Indian education too often looks at the present poverty context of Indian communities and then devises programs that are supposed to deal with and overcome the handicaps that present conditions, uh, conditions, conditions contain. Thus, we have educational programs for every conceivable kind of social and community handicap and disability. But the products of these programs are often worse for the wear, and the best students emerging from them represent but a very small percentage of the total student population. <clears throat> Compensa, compensa, 
compensatory programs fail because they take the Indian context as the immediate conditions under which Indians live. This analysis is a common characteristic of Western way of thinking, but it is certainly not a traditional Indian way of thought, nor is it the manner in which many Indian parents conceive of education or of their lives. In politics, we always speak about the coming generations and the anthologies are filled with clever sayings and quotations about the lands of our grandparents and the next generation of Indians. But, or the, essence of these things is a view of the world that encompasses many generations of people. That is to say, the proper context in Indian education, of Indian education should be whatever existing conditions are plus the traditional manner in which the tribe has faced its difficulties. In other words, the proper context is the history and culture of the tribe, regardless of the present location of its membership. We do not have good present examples of how Indian education has worked when the context define both the content and the process of education, but the school systems of the five civilized tribes certainly functioned in this manner and they functioned very well indeed. Tribal college graduates could generally speak their own language and English, and they had a reading knowledge of European language. These were school systems designed by the tribes themselves, funded by the tribes through annuity accounts in the, in the federal reg treasury, and staffed and operated by tribal governments. The Creek school system invented the school warrant system of finance that was adopted by a good many of the non-Indian school districts in the western states in succeeding years. Additionally, the five tribes have seminaries, uh, seminaries that educated the young, the young women of the tribe and orphanage, orphanages to take care of the homeless children. We have part we have part of the message of the tribes of the five tribes educational system today tribal control but we do not have the tribal concern to make the tribal concern to make education the primary function of the tribal government in these in those days tribal officials made it an annual visit to each school in the tribal system S students were expected to recite what they had learned in order to demonstrate that they had mastered the content of what was taught. Scholarships for higher education were not handed out on a tribal membership basis. Students had to earn tribal support after their secondary school days were completed. <clears throat> At graduation, whole families came to, came to the school and listened to the students demonstrate their knowledge of various subjects they had studied. The old tribal custom of reciting deeds done on war parties was translated wholly into a recit recitation of schoolwork completed. School graduations were the big social event of the year. When we try to summarize the basic philosophy of these schools, we find that there was a general belief that education was something for the tribe, not for the individual. School became an integral integral part of tribal customs. It was not something imposed on the people. It is not possible for tribes to fund their own schools today. Indeed, most American communities do not support their own schools, but receive federal, state, county, and private financial assistance so that, to a certain degree, no school district in the United States has the financial freedom to determine either the process or the content of its education. Funding is not the issue, however. The issue is providing the context in which what is taught and the processes by which it is taught make sense. Here, tribes have a very decided advantage over non-Indian school districts. An individual is a tribal member all his or her life. And consequently, the tribe always has a central core of consistent Constancy, constituency, constituency <laughs> of people who represent the individual's interest. Non Indian communities, on the other hand, <clears throat> are hardly what a person could truly call communities. 
apart from small towns that have a greater resemblance to Indian tribes than to other non-Indian communities, most American most American cities and suburbs are merely places through which people travel. It is an exceedingly rare non-Indian who lives in the same town where his or her grandparents spent their adult lives. As a result, non-Indian communities are themselves in transition. <clears throat> that is to say, they lack context, and consequently their educational programs are increasingly educating fewer and fewer people. Without a context, science quickly becomes a technology. The application of theory to practical use without so much, so much as a thought about the consequences of the application. <clears throat> this process has been determining the fate of American communities for most of this century. But now with increasing scientific knowledge, we are coming to the end of the period where we can thoughtlessly apply science. In the next decade, we will see a massive backlash by ordinary citizens against the use of technology for corporate and private profit. In defiance of the health and living conditions of people affected in affected areas. A quick reading of any magazine or newsletter devoted to ecological issues, civil rights, animal rights, or agricultural concerns will reveal the scope of modern reform movement. In short, for the first time since beginning of the American Industrial Revolution, which probably began in the 1880s, Americans are now trying to build a context in which the content of education will have some value. Indian education can exercise an enormous amount of influence in the future if we can place it once again within the tribal context. Almost every book now published by the New Age movement is crammed full of sayings by Indians to the effect that the Earth's resources are limited, to the effect that people should have priority, and to the effect that there is an important spiritual dimension to human life that human life has definite meaning that transcends, that transcends the technological world in which we find ourselves. All of this attention is merely the exploration of non-Indians, of, win of windows into the Indian understanding of the universe. There is deeply held belief that by appropriating a few wise sayings of Indians, long-standing problems brought about by the misuse of science and greedy capitalism can be solved. But merely appropriating ideas only provides slogans, not understanding. Until the present time, the theory of underlying Indian education was that it would provide a transitional process for turning the Indian child into an acceptable citizen. Education thus moved from the, an, an Indian context into a condition where the original context, the Anglo-Saxon Protestant world, was itself eroding because it was adopting an education of process and not content. If we now see the fallacy in these processes and redefine Indian education as an internal Indian in institution and an educational process that moves within the Indian context and does not try to avoid or escape this context, then our education will substantially improve. It will, or, it, it will originate as part of the tribal perspective of about, about life and pick up additional information on its return to Indian life. Establishing the Indian context in view of the absence of clearly defined tribal goals and philosophies can be easily done by, by, present, by present Indian students. <clears throat> the primary question they should ask them themselves is whether or not what they are learning will have some meaning to tribal people. And the answer at first glance will be, will be a resounding no. We presently do not know how to bring knowledge and information back to the tribe because we have not paid sufficient attention to the history and culture of our people. We have been deluded into thinking that there is no applicability, <laughs> applicability, applicability of information on behalf of the tribe or no possibility, no possibility of making our knowledge meaningful. 
So we must use what we learn about the scientific understanding of the world to ask questions of our people about how our ancestors understood the world. Remembering that the, tribes, the tribe exists over many generations and possesses a cumulative knowledge that transcends any particular generation. The answers that we will receive when we ask elders and when we, uh, re, when we read recorded accounts of beliefs and practices will often seem strange and many times irreconcilable, 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 there we go, irreconcilable with our scientific knowledge. But we must not use the scientific method to determine the true or falsity of our comparison. We must learn to place the difference within the tribal context and their, recon and re and their reconcile conflicting points of views. As Indians, we know some things because we have the accumulative testimony of our people. We think we know other things because we are taught in a school that they are true. The proper transition in Indian education should be, should be the creative tension that occurs when we compare and reconcile those two perspectives. This is now we're in the chapter 10. It's called Indigenizing Politics and Ethics, a Realist Theory. <clears throat> Transitional education challenges us to establish a creative tension. As we, are, as, we, as we compare and reconcile, where possible, Western scientific knowledge and information with our own cumulative tribal wisdom, as we, as we prepare to think about political sovereignty as an educational initiative, I can think of no better creative tension to explore than that between Western political models and an indigenous American Indian conception of politics and ethics. <clears throat> American public policy making and administration are informed by a whole set of principles and concepts entrenched in the worldview of Western civilization. They are based on principles, categories, and relationships. Oops, lost my page. Hold on. Worldview, Muslim ethics. They are based on principles, categories, and relationships that are, are unconscious and seldom questioned. <clears throat> Unless we explore practical public policy issues facing American Indians from entirely different worldview, or more specifically, from a widely shared foundation, what Delorier calls metaphysics, of indigenous North American worldviews, we will continue to make many social problems worse and we will continue to fall short of democratic promises far removed from classical social contract theory. Public policymakers, managers, scientists, and the general public might gain much by developing policies and practices for human societies based on an indigenous model of politics and ethics, which builds on an American Indian metaphysics of place and power. The indigenous theory of public policy making and administration offered here from here comes from what I will call a proto-scientific understanding of the natural world, an understanding based on human experience and empirical trial and error found in the cumulative testimony of our people. In order to understand this indigenously grounded theory of politics and ethics, three key premises must be explored and understood. First, public policy issues in Native worldviews involve consideration for the rights, or we might say more accurately, follow Deloria, following Deloria, the personalities of plants, animals, and the physical features of the natural world. <clears throat> for example, land, air, and water, as well as our relationship among our humankind. This is not naive or romantic premise, for if considered within, with the full force of its implications, 
it will be understood as signaling a profound shift in awareness. In the eyes of most modern peoples immersed in America's modern industrial consumer society, it will, according to their Western worldview, <clears throat> entail an irrational sacrifice on the part of humankind. Of course, seen through the eyes of traditional Native peoples, today's governmental pro policies, essentially natural resource and energy policies, seem unwise or unsustainable at best and at their worst comparable to a biological holocaust. Second, the goals of this indigenous theory are practical and utilitarian in a sense akin to Aristotle's son, summum bonum. However, and emphasized above the framework for the measurement of the sonum, sonum bonum, or the greatest good, is not human society, but the ecosystem or natural environment that forms one political and ethical community in the broadest sense. In short, the Native view advocates an understanding of, of public sphere, which includes many persons, including many, uh, many other, than, other than human persons. In fact, it seems to me that Deloria's proposal to understand place and power as the essential features of an American Indian metaphysics perfectly grounds the theory I am offering for exploration. Third, <clears throat> the, contrary, the contrary to many misinterpretations of Native worldviews, nearly all indigenous North American worldviews that I am familiar with consider the world as dynamic, not static. These views acknowledge the biological and physical principles of emergence, especially in their accounts of creation, which on the whole are much less anthropocentric and much more ecologically and evolutionary, albeit in a sense not reducible to popular generic, generic mo genetic models, <clears throat> than classical Western accounts of creation, whether Greek, Roman, or Judeo-Christian. The ideas presented here are the collective cultural wisdom of many indigenous peoples I have the good fortune to study with, and most importantly, live with during my last 16 years at Haskell Indian Nations University. I am merely synthesizing what has become obvious to me and many other American Indian scholars, that a foundation for an indigenous practice and theory of politics and ethics exists. Fortunately, at a general conceptual level, this indigenous foundation for politics and ethics can be conveyed by comparison with what easily accounts as the foundation of Western political theory and ethics, Aristotle's politics and the Nicomachean Nico ethics. This next paragraph is called Aristotle's Politics and Ethics. <clears throat> Two key insights shape Aristotle's thought. First, the recognition that humans are by nature political animals. And second, the understanding that ethics are the result of custom and habit. <clears throat> Politics for Aristotle is understood as the study of social arrangements, whereby individual human virtues are developed to their fullest. <clears throat> Inquiry into ethics is defined by Aristotle as the study of the greatest good within social arrangements or relationships. Aristotle's genius is in the implicit linking of politics to ethics. Aristotle correctly recognizes that human beings are by nature political or social animals, but this does not imply that human beings are, by nature, ethical in their behavior. If not born ethical actors, Aristotle rightly concludes one's ethics will be a result of learning through the experience in a community, through inclination, inclu inclination by custom and habit. On this point, Aristotle's reliance on the formulation of values and beliefs through societal experience as opposed to a system of ethical values produced through teaching or preaching has a great affinity with American Indian thinking about the sources of ethics. God is Red pointed out that the strength of American Indian value systems, including ethics, is found in the context of their communities, the natural environments from which they emerge, 
Aristotle's emphasis on the state, custom, and habit, and the greatest good provides the basis for a comparison to an American Indian or indigenous conception of politics and ethics. <clears throat> In Aristotle's logic, all things move toward their natural end, that end being the full development of the essence of that thing, the revealing of its real nature. He contends the, ex the essence of being human involves our ability to reason. However, because this ability to reason, to make choices, regarding what we ought to do is only fully developed in the context of society. It is necessary that the study of ethics leads to the study of politics. <clears throat> Aristotle's be Aristotle believed that, the, that a human being, either unable to live in or without need of society, must be either a beast or a god. He is not a part of a state. A social instinct is implanted in all men by nature. For man, when perfected, when perfected is the best of animals, but when separated from law and justice, he is the worst of all. <clears throat> Human nature leads to the creation of society. But the form that society takes is not determined by the nature of human beings. If it were, we would not see the diversity of social arrangements and phenomena throughout the world we today identify as culture. Aristotle's recognition of diversity in human virtue in various forms of the state also facilitates a comparison to American Indian politics and ethics. Aristotle's empiricism leads him to oppose both human virtue and the structure of the state as complex totalities reflecting of each other. He never loses sight of the fact that virtue for human beings is manifold with many different forms and specific practices composing the totality of what is understood as virtuous. <clears throat> His treatment of virtue as complex allows him, allows him to see that the state as the institutional embodiment of the greatest good, the summum bonum, for the greatest combination or sum of virtues making up the summum bonum can only be found in the state which allows which exists to allow all individuals to fulfill their virtue to the fullest whether they be slave servant soldier or musician a virtuous leader and a good state are those that allow every individual person to develop their own their own unique share of virtue to the fullest for ac accomplishment of the greater good <laughs> Nevertheless, Aristotle does suggest a hierarchy of values. He clearly determines the virtue of a ruler superior to the subject, and likewise free men compared to slave, adult male compared to female and child. He also indicates slaves are slaves by nature and rulers are rulers by nature. Aristotle's worldview is not one with equal opportunity with respect to virtue. While his theory is at, is at its weakest in the manner in which the complex totality of virtue is hierarchically divided, his idea that human virtue is complex and his hierarchical prejudices are clearly explained by the empiricism he adopts in lieu of following Plato's idealism. Aristotle recognizes that each individual processes some share or part of virtue, not some universal abstract concept of virtue. As no individual process is identical or all share of the complex totality that constitute human nature, society becomes a site where human beings is most fully recognized, because communities and ultimately states arise from the nature of human beings. It follows that the structures of communities and states must necessarily reflect the complex and diverse totality of human virtue. Aristotle believes the good exists in every person realizing his or her essence or a true nature, because every human being has a different share of virtue, which can only be realized in society, then the organization of society ought to be directed toward all members of society, each and every person realizing their respective virtues to the fullest. In Aristotle's mind, the function of the state must be 
must be to allow every person to realize his or her his her or his virtue to the fullest. Ethics and politics are inextrib inextribably inextribly inextribly bound together. Aristotle's naturalistic moral element is implicit throughout this discussion of politics. The leadership of a society or state, regardless of whether it be the relationship of one, a few, or the many, ought to work to, or ought to work toward the goal of realizing virtue in its full, manifold, complex totality, a complex and diverse totality of human virtues. Failure of the state. To accomplish this goal merely reflects the corruption of human activities and organization. In Aristotle's mind, there is no single or ideal form of state like Plato's Republic. Instead, numerous forms, good and bad, of the state exist. But in all cases, the distinction between the good and the bad state is made is made according to the ability of the state. And its leaders to allow all human beings therein to realize their share or part of the virtue to the fullest. All right, then that's where we're going to stop today. Then we'll stop. Stop. Then we'll start back up again tomorrow. All right. See you later.